Well, there's a lot to unpack there, isn't there? David Chowian, Nia Malika Henderson, David Priest, and Laura Coates are all with us now. Uh, David Chowian, uh I'm not sure where to begin here, but I will say a few things that stuck out from the very beginning. There is this obvious question which we cannot ignore, and we've been talking about now uh, for, I would say, since the campaign, the fact that the president is continually changing stories, and what we're hearing, the, the quote-unquote facts, seem to keep changing. Sarah Sanders said today, and I'm quoting here, I would always av advise against giving false information, and yet there's the question, David, of how can we trust anything we're hearing uh, when this president has such a blatant disregard for the truth. Well, and of course, if the president does, then that infects the people who speak on his behalf. Circle May 3rd on your calendar, because this is the day that we will look back on in this briefing where Sarah Sanders made it so painfully clear that she has lost credibility with the American people, with the reporters in that room. She completely uh, would sidestep and say that she could only give the best information she has. She was acknowledging to Jim Acosta's questioning it, it, that she came out and provided incorrect information. Well, when the spokesperson for the president of the United States of America comes to that podium and provides incorrect, false, bad information, they have no credibility to continue with that job. I'm not suggesting she's on her way out. I'm sure Sarah Sanders uh, will stay there because she's pleasing an audience of one. But she has acknowledged that she can only go out there with information the best available. If the best available is false, bad, and untrue information, she's failing at her job. And I think we saw that time and again in this press briefing today. And I think it will go down as, as the real time that Sarah Sanders really has lost her credibility with but the David, people. let me press you on that for just a moment, because yes, there is the fact that she said repeatedly, as you point out today, I'm giving you the best information I have at the time. Is this Sarah Sanders failing in her job, or is this Sarah Sanders doing her job? She's giving us the information information that she has at the time, which then continues to change based on the giver of that information, the president. But Erica, she's speaking on behalf of the president of the United States. If she can't verify that what she's going out with to that podium to answer questions with is truthful, accurate information, she shouldn't be speaking about it at all. That's not the case here. She spoke with bad information because we are now learning it was not truthful when she walked out there in March and delivered those answers. And, and she I thought she was pretty clear in acknowledging that today. Uh, there's also, I mean, if you look at sort of, the, as you point out, circle this date on our calendars, May 3rd, uh, Nia Malika, the question then is where do we go from here in terms of information and being able to trust anything that comes out of this White House? Well, I mean, I think you go back to day one with Sean Spicer, right? Uh, blatantly going out uh, and telling a falsehood about something really small, right? Crowd size. And from what we can tell, he was basically sent out there uh, by the president who was unhappy about the comparisons of his crowd size to Obama's crowd size. Uh, so this is a book in an echo of that. Here is uh, Sarah Sanders, uh, who, of course, was mocked, right? Uh, if you remember the White House Correspondents' Dinner, I mean, this was part of uh, the kind of theme of that comedian's act, the idea that Sarah Sanders had a problem with the truth. And I think we got plenty of evidence uh, today and, and through uh, through these last couple of months that she does have a problem uh, being candid. And part of her job there is almost like a reporter, right? I mean, it's almost kind of digging for as much information as she can get, verifying that information and presenting that information, right? And if she has doubts about that information, uh, then she shouldn't go out there uh, presenting that information as if it's truthful. And that's what uh, she has done. And you saw her today uh, basically deflect, uh, go to outside counsel. Uh, I'm giving you the best information uh, I can, but it's not the best information uh, if it isn't vetted and if it's a falsehood. That's not good and, information, that's terrible information. And Erica, just to add to what Nia is saying there, I think. Sarah Sanders is wearing it on her face in her words mm -hmm. uh, yeah. that she knows mm -hmm. because she is totally, to Nia's point, she's completely changed her approach to all of this. It is all yeah. now about go to outside counsel, go to outside counsel. I can only give the best information I had at the time. That is a shift because she recognizes that working in that role in this White House under this level of scrutiny has de demolished her credibility. So she's taking a different approach.
And I will say, to your point, David, I thought there was definitely a change in her demeanor today. Also, Laura, just looking at this from, from a legal perspective, uh, there was a question asked of her as to whether or not, too, she's, she's referring some of these questions and not speaking on some of them because she's concerned or has she been advised uh, for her own, uh, just in terms of her own legal issues, should she be concerned about anything? Is there anything she should be concerned about from a legal perspective when it comes to uh, the information that she's giving? Well, there's a court of public opinion credibility that's important for her and the audience that she's before every day. And there's the credibility factor that's important for, say, the Mueller investigation or anyone who's looking into whether she has knowingly provided false information in an attempt to try to have the investigators thwarted in some way, shape, or form. You can lie to the press. You cannot lie through the press trying to then obstruct a case or trying to thwart an investigation. Or if you actually are interviewed by the investigators, you cannot lie at that point in time. I actually saw a little bit differently here from a prosecutor's point of view, and that is I saw somebody who was caught flat-footed, who was trying to say that I only acted on what I knew, in a way that she was trying to distance herself from having that accusation against her, that simply that she was trying to proactively lie about a story. She also said, Erica, that when she learned about the idea that Donald Trump had reimbursed Michael Cohen, when did she learn about it? like everyone else, watching yeah. Sean Hannity in that interview. In that moment in time, that 10-foot pole elongated between her and the responsibilities in the White House. And it, to me, it said that she was on notice, that there were contradictions that she was walking into, that she'd walked away from, and that she was trying to salvage, perhaps, her, her turn in front of an investigator. Uh, which that will be interesting to see. The other thing that really struck me was the, the question, which was not surprising, would come up about what more do we know about whether or not these American detainees will be released today. And David Priest, she was very clear in saying we can't confirm any of the stuff that Rudy Giuliani said last night. Yeah, yeah let's call here, this out for uh, what I mean, it is. I mean, this is yeah. a this is a dysfunctional White House in two different ways that came out just in this briefing. One is the national security process. Is normally you don't have people freelancing talking off of different talking points about something as significant as American lives at stake. And in this case, not only did you have people with different messages, you had somebody who shouldn't have been involved in that information at all. There's no evidence that Rudy Giuliani should be in national security discussions or speaking for the president as such. But you also have a dysfunctional White House in terms of the press spokesman out there talking like this. In previous administrations, we have had press secretaries who have threatened to resign or have stepped down because of exactly this situation. I'll disagree with the idea that it's her job to go digging for information in the White House. No, these people are brought into those meetings so that they know what they can say and what they can't say, and sometimes are deliberately excluded from a sensitive meeting so that they can authoritatively say, mm -hmm. I don't have direct information on that. We have the opposite here. According to her own admission today, she's kept out of just about everything. She can't talk about how the president feels about anything that's happened. She is losing her ability to speak with any credibility anymore. Uh, let me ask you, too. Just want, just want to ask really quickly, just to, just to touch on this point about when it comes to what may or may not be happening with these three American lives in North Korea. Yeah. How much could this damage efforts, the fact that Rudy Giuliani is saying, yes, this is happening today on Thursday, <laughs> and yet it doesn't appear that that's the case. It doesn't appear that he was uh, authorized to even talk about it or well, to Erica, say that it was happening. Especially in national security, you underpromise and you overdeliver. That is a rule. You don't want to get ahead of what's happening because people overseas can change their minds. This is Kim we're talking about. He's already lured the United States down the path of going into negotiations and promising a change in behavior. It hasn't happened. Why would you possibly overpromise on the lives of Americans being held hostage? It just in terms too, I have to say it was it was brought up and we've all been wondering it today. The president tweeting earlier about these three Americans yeah, uh, and, and talking about the fact that the, the previous administration had failed. But of course, two of them were actually arrested in May and April of last year. So when President Trump was in office, and when Sarah Sanders was asked about that, she started to backpedal and somehow tried to tie at least one of these people to auto warm beer. I, I mean, Nia, as I'm listening to that, I, I'm trying to make sense of it. And frankly, I couldn't. Yeah, I, I don't think I can either. I mean, this is something that the president uh, tweeted about last night, and then uh, you heard Rudy Giuliani uh, echo it, basically, uh, doing what they often uh, do, which is a kind of tease, right? Uh, and in, in some ways, maybe that's fine uh, in matters that don't have anything to do with uh, matters of national security and people's lives and families who are waiting uh, to see whether or not their family members are going to be uh, released. But there you had Rudy Giuliani really talking about it, and it's sort of a, 
a flippant and in casual way. And a question came up, why is Rudy Giuliani even in these conversations right. uh, about national security matters? So you have all of these uh, sort of blurring of the lines in terms of uh, who should be making these announcements. Is it premature to make these announcements? And then uh, Sarah Huckabee Sanders there in some ways totally uh, out of the loop and forced into that position by all of the chaos, uh, whether it's Rudy Giuliani talking about it or, or President Obama or President uh, Trump tweeting about it and wanting to compare himself uh, to President, uh, former President Obama. I mean, it's it's really a mess. Uh, the word chaos definitely seems to sum up yeah. today. And David, uh, that's something else we can notice when we circle May 3rd on our calendar. Every time we think the chaos can't get uh, more intense, more frenetic, it does. If we go back to the Stormy Daniels payments for just a minute here, there are so many conflicting stories at this point. Sarah Sanders can't speak to the timeline because for that we have to go to the outside council as we learn today. And yet, so we're told by Rudy Giuliani that this money was repaid. Michael Cohen, at least from what I've seen as of 3.04 p.m. Eastern time today, has not confirmed that repayment. In fact, recently was talking about the fact that he hadn't been repaid. At one point there was reporting that he was saying he had to take out a home equity loan. Uh, David, is, is it your sense that we're ever going to get a real answer on any of this? Uh, well, maybe eventually through the case that is against Michael Cohen uh, mm -hmm. in the Southern District of New York uh, through investigations there. Uh, we may get some answers to it. I don't expect that we're going to get answers from the White House podium or clean uh, answers from Rudy Giuliani uh, about this. Uh, you heard a lot of questioning in the briefing room today about uh, the president in his tweet referring to that as a monthly retainer. Uh, but how could monthly retainers uh, throughout all of 2017 and perhaps into 2018 uh, with the theory that it is paying back that money. How could that have happened? And then Donald Trump says he doesn't know anything about uh, the payment. And Sarah Sanders says he had nothing, uh, no payment uh, was made whatsoever. So things do not square up here yet. There is more to learn about exactly how the payments were structured. And you're right, confirmation from Michael Cohen that he actually has been reimbursed for that money he paid to Stormy Daniels. And, and Laura, just to, just just remind us again. Just let's go down to the basics here. When you put an attorney on retainer, that retainer isn't typically used as sort of a, a fund of money to deal with unfortunate situations. Correct. It's also it, correct. It's also not one where you pad it to have profit and tax relief included. I remember Giuliani also said a little extra was included for profit and for taxation. What you have here is Rudy Giuliani who tried to, I think, distance himself and undermine any campaign finance allegation and instead he walked right into the proverbial and invited more scrutiny and also the indication when he said they funneled it through a law firm, which makes me believe that perhaps it was a willful and intentional intentional act to try to circumvent campaign finance laws, which leads you away from the Federal Election Commission, Erica, and right towards the Department of Justice's front door on these things. Even if it was a loan that needed to be repaid back, that still is an excessive contribution that needs to be reported. The fact that it was never done on either side is a violation of sorts, and they'll be held to task. Why? Because a lawyer thought that he'd be proactive about foreclosing things he should never have said. In terms of foreclosing things, too, David Priest, just in terms of the president's own transparency and honesty or lack thereof when it comes to the American people, the American voter, and before the election, what we what we didn't know about, this potential stormy yeah. deal, his taxes, that's still a question today, the real health assessment, the doctor now saying, well, he dictated that entire letter to us, Russia yeah. meetings, all of this yeah. builds up to and creates a picture that is far from flattering. No, it isn't, but it's, it's expected. Look, the president learned during the campaign that he could do this and be rewarded for it. He did not take a hit for anything that was discovered about not telling the truth to the American people or holding back things like tax returns, like medical records. The lesson he clearly learned was, I don't have to do it, and there will not be a price to pay that matters enough to me. Now, that may change once Cohen's documents are out there and once Bob Mueller digs into this information, that price may get higher and higher. But right now it appears that all the president's men are doing the best that they can to put a wall around the president, let him continue to be himself because it's worked in the past. They hope it'll continue even in the legal challenges.